All right, we are at the 12 o'clock mark. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to Aparo's Nonprofit Bites and Insights. These are our free webinar series where we bring you experts and speakers and instructors from all different industries to come share their nonprofit, their knowledge and expertise with nonprofit professionals like you. So today we are kicking off this month with a two-part series on file sharing best practices. Um, with so many options to store and share files, it can get really confusing. So we're hoping this webinar series will help to clarify some of that and also give you some ideas on workflow. Before I turn it over to Ross, I want to go over a few housekeeping details. Um, so we are recording this webinar, which will then be posted onto our web page. You'll have access to the link, which will include this recording as well as all of our other webinar recordings um, if you'd like to review those. All of you attending today will receive a follow-up email from me. It'll include the direct link to the recording as well as the slide deck and any resources that we might talk about today. Q&A and chat box are available for you to use, to ask questions, to make comments, and closed captioning is also available if you'd like to use it. So for those of you who are new to APARO, we are a nonprofit that's based in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we work with nonprofits to help, um, help them with their technology needs and challenges. The model that we use is we connect the nonprofits with skilled volunteers and corporations in the community, and together we work with the nonprofits to help them amplify their community impact. Our services are broken down into these three buckets. We have advice, education, and solutions. If you are new to Aparo, you will typically meet with a tech therapist first. And this will be a great conversation to have just to talk about your challenges, talk about your needs, and they will be the ones to help direct you to the right service. Examples of those services could include getting connected with a vetted vendor, um, a customized team training for your staff, or if there are a larger project, they'll connect you with our community impact project team. The best way to learn more is visit our website at aparo.org. If or when you decide you're ready to get connected with us, to talk about your challenges, to get some solutions, the best way is to go to our website and fill out that request form. Um, then someone from Aparo will get connected with you as soon as possible. Um, another way is my email address is included. Um, you'll also get the follow-up email from me. You can reach out to me directly and I'll be happy to help you. To stay updated on our programmings and events, we have a lot coming up. I highly, uh, highly recommend that you subscribe to our email list. And then finally, if you do like what we do, please consider writing a short Google review. That is it for me. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and go ahead and turn it over to Ross. Awesome, thank you so much, Jenting. It's always great to work with you. Um, it's great to meet everybody virtually. Uh, my name is Ross Feldman. I'm a digital advisor and virtual CIO with a managed service provider here in Charlotte called CCP Tech. Uh, we also have clients out in Charleston and DC, and we've got a pretty good spread around the Southeast. Um, a digital advisor is someone who is going to businesses or nonprofits work with their technology where it is today to advise of some changes or some growth um, to be able to align where the organization is going um, from where they're at today. Um, the presentation today is about file sharing specifically with Microsoft 365. Uh, Yenting did share with me um, her uh, the registration questions. Uh, some of the, you guys answered, you want to know more about the differentiation with 365 and Google. Um, there's a lot to be considered. Um, if you go through TechSoup, you get 10 free licenses with Microsoft and you get a thousand free licenses with Google. So on the licensing side, you might prefer Google. Um, everybody's a little bit different. Uh, some nations like Google Sheets, Google Drive, and Gmail, um, and some organizations like Outlook, SharePoint, and OneDrive. So they have similar flavors and offerings um, within both of those. 
Um, but it really depends on your organization. So we definitely want to have a further conversation with you, more of a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I always like to use the term, it depends uh, when it comes to IT, a little bit of play on words right there. Um, but we're going to talk more about 365 today. Um, and I was going to talk about where you can store your files, where they live uh, in the back end of the two different types of storage solutions. So you've got your traditional storage media and you have your cloud storage media. That term cloud has to do with not on your server. Um, when you have your own server, you control um, all of the stack, whereas with cloud, you're using someone else's server. So that's where that term cloud comes from. Um, what the providers do, like Microsoft, is they spread your data around multiple data centers. So in Charlotte, there's a data center. In Columbia, there's a data center. Um, so they'll put a copy of your data in places. So with that geo redundancy, if the Charlotte data center loses power or connectivity, uh, your files are still available because there's a copy in another data center and they spread it out amongst their cloud. Um, so the different types of internal storage, uh, traditional storage media I'm going to cover, these are bullet points. I'm going to dive more into them, but we're going to talk about internal hard drive, USB thumb drive, an external hard drive, network attached storage, a local server for storage. And then we're going to talk about the different things in Microsoft 365. Um, the term OneDrive, there are two different flavors. One's called OneDrive Personal, which you use with your Outlook.com, Microsoft.com personal account, and OneDrive for Business that comes from Microsoft 365. So I'm going to dive a little more into that in some later slides. Um, there's a publishing platform called SharePoint um, that is good for building intranets and um, company organization-wide storage. Uh, and about six years ago, this thing came out called Microsoft Teams. Microsoft Teams has file storage in it, but it's actually using two different backends, and I'll get more into that later. Um, when you're chatting, uh, doing a direct chat with an individual or a group of people in Microsoft Teams and you share a file, the file lives in your OneDrive and you're sharing it out with the others. Um, when you go into Teams, within Teams, there's a section of Teams called Teams. Uh, inside of those Teams are channels. And within those channels, when you're saving files there, there's a SharePoint website behind that doing the backend storage. So when people say I'm storing files in Teams, it's important to clarify, is it in a chat or is in a channel, we'll dive more into that. All right, so we're gonna start with traditional storage media. The first one I wanted to cover was the internal hard drive. That's the hard drive that's on your laptop. This is probably the most traditional place that people will store their files on their C drive, um, on their desktop or their documents. Um, the thing that you have to be careful with is that these are mechanical devices. Um, they have spinning drives, and then they have SSDs, um, which are chips instead. Um, but both of these devices can fail. Uh, sometimes they'll warn you through uh, diagnostics, and sometimes they'll just fail on you without warning. They are mechanical devices. So that's the biggest risk of when you save files on your internal hard drive. Um, you want to have backups of your internal hard drive. Uh, if you don't uh, and it fails, you'll lose your files. Um, so there's a possibility when you're saving things on your internal hard drive that something might not be backed up. Um, internal hard drives have a size, 120 gigs, 256 gigs. Um, that is a physical limitation. You can't make that drive any bigger. You'll have to swap it with a bigger hard drive. So with this version of storage versus cloud, Cloud will be more expandable and allow you to be able to do more, whereas the traditional, you're limited to what you physically have on your machine. Um, as Yenting mentioned, we've got the Q&A section and the chat. Um, also feel if you want to um, pop into there and ask any questions, I've got them pulled up and Yenting is keeping an eye on it as well. 
Um, I put a little screenshot of OneDrive for Business where you can back up your hard drive files to OneDrive for Business. Um, it's included and it's a, a free feature. Um, normally, you get a terabyte of space in OneDrive for Business, which is larger than your 120 gig or 256 gig hard drive. So you have plenty of room to back up your files in OneDrive if you turn that setting on. Another place that's some people will save their files is a, a USB thumb drive. Um, some people call it a stick drive. Um, the same thing with a thumb drive as with your internal hard drive is there's a possibility of failure. Um, these are also, uh, these are not mechanical. They spin, they're chips, but chips fail. Um, some folks might put it through the wash if you leave it in your pocket, in your uh, pants. Um, it could just be that they're um, in a car and they get overheated. And so there's a possibility of failure uh, with those thumb drives. Um, because they're detached from your computer, they can go missing. Uh, people can steal them. Um, so there is a risk if you put your files on a thumb drive that they may get uh, lost or stolen. Um, the same thing with backing up your internal hard drive, because your thumb drive is not plugged in, it's not getting backed up. So there's a risk of losing files um, if your thumb drive fails or goes missing that you won't have a backup of those files. Um, similar with the internal hard drive, um, thumb drives have a limit of the amount of files you can fit on there. Uh, then you'd have to get a bigger thumb drive. Um, there is a risk because this thumb drive is traveling with you and getting plugged into random computers. Uh, if there's a virus on a computer um, and it has the capability to replicate itself, that's called a worm, uh, it will copy itself onto that thumb drive. And then when you plug it into your computer, you're bringing that risk over to you as well. So there's a risk when you're using thumb drives to copy, store, or move files that you might be copying, storing, or moving a virus in between computers as well. Uh, an external hard drive is a little physically larger than a thumb drive, sometimes has more storage, but again, with it being a disc that spins, uh, they can fail. Um, because they're unplugged from your machine, they can go missing. Um, they might not be backed up. Uh, they might also have a limited size of how much you can store inside of that thumb drive or that uh, external hard drive. Uh, and that same risk of viruses exists with external hard drives. You're unplugging it from one computer, plugging it into another computer. So if one of those computers is infected, uh, it's possible to, the drive will get infected and you're bringing that uh, along with you. Um, an external hard drive through USB this is network attached storage. Um, some people use Synology. Um, it is a file share that is just a file share. It's just a bunch of hard drives. It's not a full-fledged licensed Microsoft server. It is just a series of drives that are shared out um, that are available through the network. So that means that um, with those USB drives and your internal drives, those aren't shared with others. Um, this allows you to have a pooled set of storage uh, that you can be able to share with others inside the network uh, at the organization. Um, it is possible for these to fail, um, but the Synologies come with six or seven uh, drives that can be mirrored with each other so that if one does fail, uh, the other ones have copies and the RAID storage structure can be rebuilt when a, uh, another hard drive is put in to replace the failed drive. So there's a little better redundancy with uh, network attached storage than with the internal USB or external. Um, because it's on the network, it should be locked in a closet somewhere, but just like a thumb drive, it could be stolen. It could go missing, um, and that's all your files going along with it, unless it's backed up. So we, of course, encourage folks to back up their network attached storage so that in case it does go missing, uh, you have backups of those files. Um, same thing, limited size. So you have five hard drives, they're eight terabytes each. There's a certain point where you're going to run out of storage space and have to put in larger drives. Um, the same risk of viruses. Um, there could be a virus that's put on network attached storage, uh, and then that's exposed to the whole network versus those thumb drives where each computer is exposed as it's plugged in. Um, you do have to have a network 
for it to work. So if your network loses power, you won't be able to get to your network attached storage. Um, the advantage of network attached storage is it's shared uh, so that folks can share files in between uh, computers and with each other collaboratively. So the last traditional type of storage is a local server. Uh, normally it runs on Microsoft Windows Server. Um, there is the risk that it can fail, um, but it is possible to put multiple hard drives in a server, so it's redundant. Um, you should also run backups on your server. Uh, you'll have limitations of the hard drives, how big they are, how many files you can get on there. Um, the operating system like Microsoft Windows Server, um, right now we're working on upgrading um, folks that are on Server 2019. Um, that's going end of life this year. Uh, so there's that cost and uh, expense of upgrading a file server with a new operating system um, and getting that license for the new operating system. So these are all additional costs. Uh, again, if the network is down, you can't get to your local shared server, um, but you can share access amongst the staff. All right, so before uh, the call started, Yenting and I were talking a little bit about this. There's actually two flavors of OneDrive, um, OneDrive Personal and OneDrive for Business. Um, you can get OneDrive Personal for free, and it has five gigabytes of storage included, um, and you would use your personal Microsoft account to get that started. Um, with Microsoft 365, OneDrive for Business, you use your 365 work account to access OneDrive for Business and you get uh, one terabyte of storage, which is plenty of room um, for your personal file storage. If you run out of storage in your OneDrive, you can pay for additional storage. So when we're talking about traditional media, with your internal hard drive or your thumb drive and you run out of room, cloud storage is expandable and you can get more storage instead of having to go somewhere else and start again. Um, the question people ask is, how do I know if I have OneDrive personal or OneDrive for business? When you're looking at it in File Explorer, it says it right next to it. So OneDrive Personal is the five gigabyte one, and OneDrive with the organization name is OneDrive for Business. So Contoso is the example that Microsoft uses when they're doing examples of organizations. Um, for Yenting, it says OneDrive dash Aparo on hers. Um, so we'll have the name of the organization right next to the OneDrive um, shortcut. Um, <clears throat> on this screenshot, you'll notice an extra column um, that exists in OneDrive that doesn't exist elsewhere on your computer. It's called status. So what OneDrive allows you to do is to synchronize files with the cloud, um, but you can also leave them on the cloud. If you have a very small internal hard drive on your computer, you can actually save files and leave them out on the cloud and not have them on your PC so it doesn't take up space. The problem is if you go away from your Wi-Fi or you hop on an airplane and you don't pay for the in-flight Wi-Fi, you won't have connectivity to get to those files. So they're in the cloud and you want to have them with that green check mark if you want them stored on your computer so you can work on them when you're offline. So OneDrive for Business is that cloud redundancy I was talking about. So instead of the internal hard drive where you don't have duplicates of your files, the files are already duplicated across multiple data centers across the United States and the world. Um, Microsoft actually doesn't guarantee they will keep your files safe. They are there for the infrastructure. Um, but what we do as an MSP is we offer a 365 backup service uh, that allows us to back up your OneDrive and your email and your SharePoint so that um, in case there is a major loss of data, um, there's a backup um, of your cloud. Um, we also have had uh, unintentional and intentional um, where folks have gone in and deleted uh, all the contents out of SharePoint or OneDrive. Um, sometimes it's an accident, sometimes it's on purpose and someone has done it maliciously on their way out. Um, sure. Um, so I got a question from Crystal. I'm going to answer it live. So her question 
was, can you say again how to get the check mark versus the cloud next to the files? So when you're looking at a file, let's say this screenshot says the annual financial report. Before you open the file, it has a cloud icon. If you double click on it, it's gonna download and go green. Um, you can also right click on the file choose OneDrive, and then it says make available offline. You can do that to a specific file or you can do it to a whole folder. So in this example, desktop is available only in the cloud. You would right click on desktop, choose OneDrive, and then choose make available offline and it'll download all those files to your hard drive as long as you have room on your hard drive to do it. Crystal, I hope that answered your question. Feel free to also comment in the chat. Okay, so this screenshot is that example of backing up your files using OneDrive for business. The documents folder, the pictures folder, and the desktop folder all are capable of being backed up into OneDrive. So you can do that traditional, I save on my internal hard drive, but those folders get backed up in OneDrive. So you can turn on that feature inside of OneDrive. I probably got this question most over the years. Um, OneDrive's been around for 15 years. SharePoint's been around for 22 years. Um, what's the difference between OneDrive for Business and SharePoint? Um, the way I like to describe it is that file cabinet that's under your desk is your OneDrive for Business. It's your personal file storage. It is files that you are working on and you alone, but you can share those files with others. So if you're working on paperwork and you want someone else to review it, you can share your personal files with someone else. Sort of when someone comes over to your desk, you open up your drawer and in there is your file cabinet, people can be able to share and see your files. So that's your personal storage. SharePoint, is that cabinet, that file cabinet that's out in the hallway where everybody collaboratively shares that storage. So when you are writing a file and it's just for you, put it in your OneDrive. If it's a file that's supposed to be shared with others, awesome, Crystal said thanks, great. Um, when shared with others, you want to put it out in the file cabinet in the hallway. So shared file storage is SharePoint. Personal file storage is OneDrive for business. So your team can access those files defaultly that are out in SharePoint shared with the team. Uh, and with your OneDrive, you have to share those files or those folders individually with people. Um, there are three levels of permissions inside of SharePoint. You can be an owner, a member, or a visitor. That breaks down to three types. An owner has full control over the permissions and the files. A member has edit rights, so they don't have permissions to grant others more permissions, but allows folks to edit the files that are already in there, add, remove files that are inside of SharePoint. And visitors have read access. So if you want someone to be able to see a file and not edit it, for instance, a policy document, HR would own that document. Um, they would allow another team operations to edit that document, but they just want the rest of the staff to view the document, they would just be visitors. Um, this is something that's come up. Um, organizations have turnover. People do come and go. If you have everything in OneDrive, it's tied to that individual. So John Smith um, works at this organization and he's left the company. If we delete John Smith's account, we'll end up deleting everything that's in his OneDrive, including the files he was sharing out. If the file is in SharePoint, then it's not a tie to an individual. John Smith may have created the file, John Smith may have edited the file, but once John leaves, the other members of the team can still have access. Um, sometimes what we'll do is before we delete uh, an account is we'll ask who's the manager and then we'll grant the manager access to John's files in case they need to get to anything that was in there. I talked a little bit about this earlier. I said I was going to dive into it. Uh, how to change control 
that would be helpful. Okay. All right. So Crystal has a question about change control um, with file permissions. I will dive into it a little bit more on another slide. Um, and if we have time left at the end, I can dive in a little more. I should have a good screenshot for that one. Yes, coming up. Okay. In Teams, when you are in a one-on-one -on -one or a group chat and you share a file, that file is put into your OneDrive for business and you're sharing it out with the people that are in that chat. If someone joins the chat later, they won't have permissions to that file. So you'll have to share it with them again. If you put it inside of the Teams sections of Teams, it gets stored in SharePoint, which means that someone who joins in the future will have access to that file. So again, it's thinking about is the file for this specific group, this one time, or is this file something that somebody will need more in the future? So if you think someone will need more in the future, I would recommend putting them into the channels inside of Teams um, and not into a one-on-one -on -one chat. Um, there is a tab inside of Teams, an app on the app rail called Files. Um, click on that. Take a look. Um, what it'll do is it'll show you files that you've recently shared, files you've recently worked on, and files that have been modified by others that you have access to. So it really gives you that good insight. If you look at that third column that says location, uh, it will show you where that file is. For instance, Tony Redmond's OneDrive is where this file is located versus one of the teams or team channels. So it gives you that visibility of, oh, that file I was just looking at, where does that file live? And this shows you where that file lives. All right, the summation of all the previous slides is what is the ideal workflow when I'm creating or working with files? Um, when you're creating the file, you want to start with it in OneDrive for Business. That's the best place to put all of your files. They're going to be backed up. They're cloud redundant. If you go offline, you've got a copy of it. Um, if you need someone to review that file in the upper right-hand corner of Word, Excel, PowerPoint, there's a button there that says share. So from your personal OneDrive, you can share permissions with others. I've got a couple more screenshots a little further in the presentation showing that whole share button. Um, you can be able to share the file with others to get it reviewed. When you're sharing a file with a project team is where I would say move it out of your OneDrive and put it into that team inside of Teams under file channel files so that it's shared collaboratively automatically with that team. Remember that's that SharePoint backend that's inside of Teams so that when folks get access to a team, they automatically get access to the files that are inside of that team. So you don't have to grant access as new people join. It's automatic if it's inside of Teams. Um, we've tried to get organizations to use SharePoint as an intranet. So policy documents, procedures, um, standard operating procedures, um, your HR documents, your how to get a parking pass, store those in SharePoint. Uh, go ahead and put that in that more permanent cloud storage so that folks can be able to access it automatically when they join the company, again, instead of having to share it out of your OneDrive. Okay, I don't have any questions in Q&A and chat is caught up. Inside of Microsoft 365, there is an area called the admin portal. You may not have access to this depending on how your organization is set up. Your IT person or your IT management company may be the one that has access to this, but there's a settings screen inside of SharePoint Admin Center where you can define sharing how it's allowed. Um, for example, the defaults, which is right here, is anyone can share with anyone and it doesn't require a sign-in. Uh, I do consider this a risk where I share a link with Yenting, Yenting shares it with Todd, Todd shares it with Sam, and it ends up that lots of people have access to a document that I didn't intend 
to have happen. So I wouldn't recommend the most persist, uh, permissive setting of allowing anyone with a link. I would recommend the next one down, which is guests will get a link and they have to verify that they are who they are. So Yenting will get a link from me in her email that she clicks on and it says verify and she has to put her email address and she'll get a code. Now, with security, as you put in more layers of security, it causes a layer of inconvenience. So instead of Yenting just getting a link, clicking and going, she now has three or four steps, plus she has to wait for her email to come in. So as you secure your environment in a higher level, then you will have that difficulty of it takes more steps, but your data is more secure. Uh, a lot of you guys uh, in the registration did say, how do I? secure my files better. This is a great example of you looking at your organization and seeing, does my organization need stricter file sharing or less restrictive? You might be too restrictive right now and you wanna have that ability that anyone with a link can be able to get to a document. Um, there are a whole handful of settings that go beyond um, this screen uh, that are lower in there. But again, you have to be an admin to be able to get into the SharePoint Admin Center to be able to make any adjustments to these settings. Uh, in the Microsoft way, you can set SharePoint or OneDrive to a certain setting default, and then you can go into a specific user and give them more or less permissive settings. So for every setting in the admin center, you can go into someone's user profile and then adjust their OneDrive or SharePoint site permissions to be either more granular or less granular, depending on the needs. So when I was in the enterprise world, the biggest fight was with the marketing team. So we wanted it to be secure. We wanted to have the link. We wanted to have authenticator. And the marketing department says, literally, we just want anyone to click this link. This is marketing materials. It's OK. Marketing materials, there's no um, proprietary information in here. We want anybody to click this link. So what we could do is for those specific marketing accounts and marketing sites, we would be more permissive of allowing sharing to happen in those sites but not for everyone as a default. So again, as an organization, you have to decide what it is that you need to allow and what folks need to be able to do. When you're inside of SharePoint, which is the top screenshot, and you're inside of OneDrive, which is the bottom screenshot, you get the same options, share or copy link. Now, Remember earlier, I said store your stuff in Teams or SharePoint, since SharePoint's the back end of Teams channels. If someone already has access and just needs to know where a document is, you would use copy link. You don't need to grant them access again by share because they already have access to the SharePoint site. So copy link, Yenting, here's our policy on gas reimbursement. Here you go. Share would mean I'm granting permission to this file or folder. And you want to think about that. Do I need a person to have access to this one file and share all individual files out? Or do I need to share access for the whole folder so they can access all the folders? So you need to kind of keep in mind the differentiation between share and copy link. And both of those exist in OneDrive and in SharePoint. I put a screenshot in here just to give you an example. When you do click on share, it's gonna ask you the email address. So I have to type in Genting's email address to give her access to this file. Once I put her email address, I have the rights to send a message in Outlook and hit send, or I can do that bottom option. Like if I'm chatting with her on Teams, I can grant her access and skip the whole email and just hit copy link at the bottom. And Yenting has access because I just granted her access, copy link, and I drop it into the chat. And then she has access to the file that she needs. I talked about this a little earlier. Those screenshots were when I'm inside OneDrive, when I'm inside SharePoint. When you're working on an individual file, like for instance, I need Yenting, she's my supervisor, to review a file that's in my OneDrive. 
Inside of Word and PowerPoint and Excel, there's a share button that you can click on to be able to share the file directly with Yenting or whoever. Um, but that same, remember that differentiation I said, share versus copy link. If Yenting already has access to where this lives, I could just copy link and shoot it to her. Um, but if she doesn't have access, then I have to share this file with her. Um, Crystal had asked about manage access. So you'll notice this extra option. That is where you control the permissions of that file. So I'm inside of Word. I can hit share and go down to manage access. Um, and on my next screenshot, I'll show you when you're inside of SharePoint or OneDrive, you go to the file or folder that's in question and you hit the three dots to the right of it. And you have an option that says manage access. When you click on manage access, you get this pop-up that shows you you're already sharing this file with everyone who has this link. What you can do is you can turn off that link for everyone. So I shared it with Yenting, she shared it with Todd, Todd shared it with Sam. I want it all to stop. I can go into manage access, click the three dots next to the link and I can remove that link so it doesn't work for anyone. Additionally, let's say for instance, I shared it with Yenting, Todd and Sam and I don't want Sam to have access. Just below that link, there is a, this link works for expansion that shows you everyone you've shared this with, then you can remove access here by hitting the X to the right. All right, that was almost all of my slides. I'm coming up on my last slide. Yes, OneDrive. Okay, so Crystal's question was, is this manage access for OneDrive or SharePoint? It's both. They have the same options because OneDrive is based on SharePoint technology. You have the same three dots manage access in SharePoint and the same three dots manage access inside of OneDrive. Okay, so this is the final slide. Uh, it was in response, awesome. Yenting, can you take Crystal off of mute for me? Thank you. Hey, Crystal, can you hear me okay? Not quite hearing you yet. Oh, here we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, I got a weird situation with technology here. So <laughs> <laughs> this is phenomenal, first of all, Ross. Like I just looked over my cubicle and was like, look, we now know how to do this. And I was like, let me try it though as he's going through this. So we love SharePoint. We're doing mm -hmm. exactly what you recommend, Ross. It is where we house all of our things, not only our processes and procedures and policies, but literally everything. We have that joint file cabinet. Good. When I am looking at that manage access, mm -hmm. when I click on it, I don't see the same thing you have. <laughs> like I see people and I see groups and we are all as, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to ask there <laughs> besides I don't see individual people to manage access. I just see JACC shared, talking about me, shared drive owners versus drive visitors versus drive members. Yes, so there is an advanced class that doesn't exist where we can get into the hour long that it would take to cover SharePoint permissions. <laughs> um, I've been a SharePoint administrator for about eight years um, of my career, and it's probably the most top 10 difficult things about SharePoint. SharePoint does permissions individually or SharePoint As groups. groups. Yeah. Or okay. Microsoft has 365 groups and Microsoft security groups. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop my Calendly into the chat um, if any of you guys want to schedule one-on-one -on -one time just for us to deep dive. Okay, okay, that's fair. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. And for those watching on the recording, reach out to Yenting and she will get us connected since the chat won't be in the recording. Um, one of the registration questions had asked about getting files on the phone and on the go. I highly recommend this because we're all on the go. We're all connected all the time. There are two apps on both iPhone and Android. 
Um, one's the OneDrive for Business app, and the other one is the SharePoint app. So if your files that you're working on live in OneDrive, you'll pull up the OneDrive for Business app, log in with your Work 365 account, or your personal OneDrive account if you're doing the personal storage. Um, and that will show you files that you can view and download from there. Uh, in the SharePoint app, um, there's um, mostly about the news feed. Um, there's a way to kind of see some of the files that are in there. Um, they're always adding new functionality to these apps all the time. Microsoft is very open to feedback. So if you click on help or about or more uh, in any of their apps or programs or any of those, they're always apt for suggest a feature, send feedback. Um, they actually have people whose whole jobs are to read and process that feedback. So they're always open um, for it. Um, that was my final slide. Um, I am a open book, uh, so feel free to raise your hand so we can take you off of mute. Um, Yentik is also going to send that follow-up email where you can be able to email me uh, directly. I can try and answer questions for you and meet with you. Um, it is always a pleasure to do this. Um, I would love for those Googlers to come join me next week where we talk about the Google Drive uh, and the idiosyncrasies of that. Well, as questions are coming in, um, Ross, first of all, thank you so much. I always admire the way you can explain things so clearly. Um, it's one thing trying to read all about all of this and try and do it yourself, but somehow you managed to make this really clear. So I really appreciate that. Um, as people are coming up with questions, uh, I'm kind of going through the registration. I know you kind of skimmed over it, um, but there's one particular one around company turnover and what mm -hmm. to do when that happens. Um, so can you kind of dive deeper into that in terms of best practices around uh, making sure that's that continuation of data and all of that? Exactly. So um, Google Drive and um, OneDrive if you delete the account, it deletes the drive data. Um, it is possible to have the data moved to someone else or someone else granted access, normally be the person's manager. Um, but it's important to, when you request your IT provider to close, delete, disable an account, to let them know who the data needs to go to. Um, there's a screen in, in Google Drive um, that it asks you before you delete the account, where would you like to move the drive data to? Uh, and you can assign it to someone else um, so that the drive data moves um, over to there. So um, I hope I answered that question. <laughs> I think so, yeah. What about um, like large files, like videos? Do you recommend people storing that in Microsoft? Yeah, we're in a world where about 50 megabytes is gigantic for an email. You're lucky if you can get a two megabyte email to get to your destination. So what I like to do is I like to put my files, my large ones into OneDrive and then do the share link, um, send it in Outlook um, where it says, hi, this file is too large, but you can download it here from my OneDrive. Any questions? I always have a silent crowd dancing. It's my luck. <laughs> because you explain it so well. That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think um, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Give you about 15 minutes back in your time. Like Ross said, next week will be around Google. Um, so please come to that. Let's see. Uh, you legit explained it the best. Yep. See, <laughs> um, so excited to have you back, Ross, for that. And um, everyone else, I will be sending that follow-up email. Typically, I can send it by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, so if you do have any questions, please uh, respond to that. Um, and then sure. we'll kind of go from there. Well, have a great rest of the week, everyone, and hopefully see you next week. Thanks, Ross. See yeah. you.